Um, so this is our, our farm. Uh, this is our back 80 acres. You can see Lake Superior in the background. Um, and this is our farm along the northern edge of the 120 acres. Spear hiking trails on that ridge. So you get an idea, we're up about uh, 1,200 feet. The lake, Lake Superior is at 600 feet and the ridge is about 1,500 to 1,600 feet between the two. That ridge is what saves us from a lettuce farm to growing tomatoes and greenhouses. So um, keeping that cold lake away. Did you drain to the end of the lake or north? Uh, we drain uh, along southwest through the Baptism River oh, okay. and then down the Baptism River, Salmon River, Baptism River. So yeah, that ridge holds back and then it has cuts through as you have all those beautiful waterfalls. We've been there 33 years. <laughs> Um, we came when uh, I picked it on a map uh, when we were working on a farm for a honeymoon in New Mexico. <laughs> and uh, literally, my wife was uh, southern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I came back and I said, that's okay. We can change all of our plans. I mean, everything was planned to go to Maine. Uh, but we have to go to Finland, Minnesota. She's like, but there may not be any farms there. I said, it's either Finland or we're going to Maine. And so we drove up there and we bought the 40 acres. And then we since got the 80 acres with the lake on it. And uh, Plan to when we bought it 33 years ago, we planned to die there, and so we've actually picked out where we're going to get zoned at cemetery. And uh, I don't know how how uh, ambitious my kids are, so I might have to dig my own hole while I still can <laughs> cover it up. Uh, so so this is kind of uh, uh, the fields, the crop fields. To get an idea. We've been selling vegetables for years uh, through a CSA. Uh, but now we're growing trees and vegetables and seeds and shifting some of our operation. In the last three years, I got a job at the university and it changed a lot of things. And my job is uh, as extension for Northeast uh, Sustainable Development. And this is my crew. It, I have a board and four work groups and the four work groups all determine direction and focus of the area um, of the work. And that's our crew. I have two VISTAs this year. I'll have four VISTAs, uh, two foresters of the four, uh, myself and Diane. And But we have all these people behind it that make up our boards. This is a tree that collapsed, one of our largest spruces on the planet until it fell. Um, and the last three old, old trees finally fell in the last few years. This is our current uh, business. Um, the four focus areas are agriculture and food, resilient communities, natural resources, and clean energy. And so our work uh, determines, who, yeah, you can shut that off, perfect. The work determines uh, which projects get funded, and all of our projects have these goals. Um, it's community vitality and university partnership. And we always include community leadership. If it doesn't have a community leader, we don't want to do it. So it's not a top down, it's a bottom up. And uh, then we also have a funding cycle. And so we've just funded nine projects for this next year uh, to work on sustainability within those four focus areas. So that's my current job. I get to do and get paid first time with health insurance. Uh, and I get to do what I used to do in the evenings. I get to do during the days and get paid for it. So it's very exciting. And I get to work with an amazing group of people, experts throughout the fields. But I'm here to talk about one of those projects called the Forest System Migration Project. Um, if you have any questions along the way, please, you know, just go for it. Um, it's going, but it goes slowly. Wow, it's really upset now. 
There we go. I have a lot of clicks on this, so we'll see. Um, so what we're looking at is the supply chain of trees. A lot of our trees are now bought from Canada and other places that are grown there, and there's going to be an increasing demand for trees. These are, are fruit trees, or these are forest trees. Look around the forest. So, and I'll I'll go through all this. So we're looking primarily about the forest and what's happening with the forest. So we'll be dealing with research, um, uh, seed collecting, growers network, and then the final thing is the planters. So what we're looking at. Um, is trying to build a supply chain. There we go. So we're going to start with the research. Um, and there's a couple names that you want to see here. Meredith Cornett with the Nature Conservancy, Julie Edison with UMD, a geneticist, and then Lee Frerlich on the big systems. So what the research is addressing is the fundamental change of our forests. And as you look at that, it comes down to something very non-academic. A phrase just says, our forests are sick. Um, and you may see that. Uh, we're experiencing it. Uh, and we're having some challenges with it. So when we look at the species, the species in decline are guess what? Aspen, paper birch, white spruce, black spruce, balsam fir, tamarack are our forests. <coughs> Uh, oops, the species that are on incline are red maple. Uh oh, there we go. White pine will do fine. Fir oak, red oak, and basswood. In fact, white pine might do better uh, in, in some areas of our area. So we are going to be seeing a change. This is our climate and where it's heading. Um, as you can see here, oh, come on, baby. As you see here, we have the broadleaf forest, the prairies in the red, and then you've got the mixed forest in the light green, and then the boreal forest. That's where we are right now. Best case scenario, boreal forest is gone in 50 years. Best case scenario is it's a mixed forest still. Right now, we're on the worst case scenario. Guess what? Mixed forest is gone. So what we're trying to do is figure out how do we maintain a forest canopy, not just for our lives and all what we have tradition, but for the wildlife and logging and all sorts of things. Uh, I've been really skeptical about this information, but I'm seeing it on our farm now in Finland. I'm seeing the grasses come in. I'm seeing the, seeing the spruce and bud worm opening up sections. So things are changing quite a bit. So when you look at Lake County and you look at Dodge County, that's where we're at, heading for. Okay, as things move north, um, we're looking to move from what you see in that top right picture to grasslands with forested lands. And yeah, so that is our situation. And come on, baby. So that's in 50 years or just that's in 50 years according to this. Okay. So that's where we're looking for. And I'm just gonna do this because it's quicker. Uh as you go further in time. Uh, sure. As you go further in time, uh, we're looking at winters being in the Illinois, northern Illinois area. And uh Summers being in the Nebraska time. Well, won't that be next? <laughs> so let's move on to the next part of the supply chain, the seed collectors. Um, and what we have here is what we are doing, the research, such by Julie Edison and, and Meredith is showing that if I grow a seed from like say St. Cloud, and I grow a seed from my forest in Finland, you grow them side by side, same species. The ones that are doing much better, better survival, growing faster than the ones from St. Cloud already. So what we're seeing is the genetics from central and southern Minnesota are outperforming the genetics from our own area. And so the idea is to take seed from central and southern Minnesota 
plant them to be planted as tree seedlings in northern Minnesota. So this is a northern red oak from south of here, and it, it will do better than the northern red oak planted from our, our one northern red oak in our forest uh, on our farm. This one didn't make it because it was three inches and a half, and to sell it, you need four inches. So it overwintered, and that's re -spread. So again, we're also trying to diversify the parentage. Let's go to the next slide. So we're looking at species here. Basswood we have, uh, black will, there's some even in Ely, Burr Oaks, off and on throughout the area, Northern Red Oak is. And so what we're looking at is this year, we're planting the blue species. Um, and we've had to collect all of those species uh, from central and southern Minnesota. So we have to collect, we have to create a new network. We're looking for a number of parents greater and multiple locations for the same species. Next slide. So we're looking at this approach, the growers and greenhouses growing the crops where they'll be planted and the seed collector. Uh, and what we're looking at is increasing the number of serious seed collectors and increasing the diversity, southernizing the genetics. And I don't mean Georgia, I mean Southern Minnesota. Um, so as we go on to the next slide, you can see our first year, and this is our first year of Vista, Joel, uh, he was fantastic. We were short on seed and he went and collected like a whole bunch of seed. Um, and we collected over 400,000 that first year, a little over a million this year, but a lot are northern white cedar. Um, and so we'll have them again next year. And then we're, we're gearing up for a new collection cycle this summer, this fall, and we hope to collect 1.5 million seeds. Right now, seeds are the limiting factor. Now with my new forestry vistas, we'll be able to do better germination tests along the way so that we have a better planting guide. Because right now we're uncertain germination. You don't know how many to plant. You go by statistics, but actually testing them will be help a lot. So we move on to the seed collection. Then the seeds, they have to be stored and stratified, which means cool, sometimes wet, moist and cool. And some have to be scarified, which is nicked to get the seed coat to open. So that's all being done at UMD under Julie Edison's care and Matt Denke at the greenhouse. Um, and then we'll have our VISTAs helping out. Next slide. We're doing trainings, trying to solidify the expertise because a lot of people say, oh, I'd like to collect, but actually how do you do it? So going from the want to the do, we've got to be building more trainings. So we have a lot of initiatives training. This is a training I did this past uh, February. Um, and these are the seed collecting network that we're looking at. So Southern moving up. And then we're trying to build fact sheets. I have a whole fact sheet. So if you want to go collect in St. Cloud area or somewhere else, you could look at the fact sheet, figure out when to go and we have timelines. So we're trying to build the resources for this network. And then we have iNaturalist, which is a good way to identify where things are. And then an email group. So that's part of the seed collectors, if you want to keep going. So that's now moves us to the supply chain to the growers. Right now, we're not able to find basswood. We're not able to find a lot of these trees because the big companies are, are doing the classic forestry ones, pine and spruce and uh, some of the species that aren't going to be beneficial. Uh, for us in the future. So as we move to the growers network, uh, we started last year with 14 growers. Uh, we have 17 this year. And you can see this is a rough estimate of the different areas. There's a cluster in Finland along the shore and then a bunch of Aiken. Um, and so we're working with the Sustainable Farming Association to build this network out. We're hoping to add five more this year. Uh, get up to 60 or 70. My goal is to get a million of these climate forward, climate smart tree seedlings from this network of growers. So that would bring a million dollars that's currently leaving the region, leaving the state, and get it back into our farmers' hands, which is really tough because the average farmer last year nationwide lost $1,800. Mm -hmm. So if we can find some poor profitable aspects of agriculture, that we can then support the system and support that rural infrastructure. 
Um, so as we go on, you get to see this is one in uh, the Alley Cat Farm in, in uh, Aiken County. You can go through these slides real quickly. We provide the seeds. Uh, we get them to them, and then they plant. Seeds are very different. Acorns are big. They have to be planted that first year, or they rot. Um, you can't freeze them. As opposed to other seeds, you can store and freeze like these tiny little birch seeds. <laughs> and we plant seven birch seeds per uh, pot. For the oaks, we uh, let them uh, sprout, and then we plant the sprouted acorn in. Uh, so we get full, whatever sprouts get planted. Um, and we had a bad seed year last year, but good the year before. So uh, we're growing these out in trays, have different trays. I have plugs. Um, some people have trays. This is the largest that the Nature Conservancy will take. Uh, they'll take up to two inches wide and eight and a quarter inches long and smaller. And so we have this kind, and then we have one that's a little shorter. That's where the basswood and the maple are in. And then we have one that's uh, narrow, and that's where the birch uh, and the pines and anything else we put. So I'm growing about, I'm planting about 11,000 plugs this year on our farm as backup to the system as we learn how to do this. And guess what? We had hoped to plant about 8,000 basswood for the whole network. And we just did a basswood email, and no one's seeing any germination of the basswood. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know what we're going to do. I'm thinking on my right, right up here, it's like maybe it needs to be a fall planted. So you plant them in the plugs in the fall and then let them go through a natural cycle because they need 120 days of wet, cold. And if they're outside, but then you have to accommodate for rodents. So you have to put screen down, and then you have to take it all up when the snow comes. Because they have a really tough seed, you have to scarify that seed. And then it's only 20% germination rate. So there's a reason why no one's growing these. But with 17 farmers or 50 farmers down the road, we're going to become hot dog and we're going to know how to do this because farmers are that way with challenges. Um, so planting and growing, if you go to the next slide, there's Sandy, another one of our growers. Um, and then they get packaged. So we stored them over the winter. They get boxed up and then brought for the, the big, you know, as a wholesale account to the next slide, you'll see, we bundle them up in groups of 10, 20, 25, wrap them, put them in boxes. And then the next slide will show those boxes uh, were delivered to two harbors, Nature Conservancy pivots out of here, and then they are, have already started planting. Uh, so this year was mostly birch and predominantly red oak. Next slide is the planters. It all started with the planters, because if we don't have a market, we don't want to start this thing. We've got $40,000, $50,000 invested in plugs and trays. And so Nature Concerns has said, we'll guarantee buying $40,000 from it. And then Minnesota Power said, we'll, we'll, we'll do $20,000. I said, oh, maybe $10,000. <laughs> and the Star Water District. So the demand's really there. The hope is eventually, because there's a new goal happening for the million acres of land through central Minnesota that's not really good for agriculture, but it used to be forest, replanting that whole section with these climate forward genetics. So the demand is six times what's currently being produced and available in our state. So we hope to play our part as a collective group of growers. But the planters, Nature Conservancy, Minnesota Power, Rajala, County Forestry, some organizations like North Shore Forest Collaborative, private landowners, and SWCDs. And we had to, we didn't produce as much as we had hoped. We planted 80,000 trees last year. This year, we're planting 90,000 trees. So we had some uh, supportive, but next year, kind of like next year, we'll get those trees. So, so we're hoping for better germination, but again, our basswoods down and on. So we stack them up, deliver them. We're going to start doing some bare root, bare root um, uh, soil water districts like them. Uh, and for some of the tree seedlings that take longer, like white cedar, we're going to probably just bare root them from the start. Uh, I've got them in plugs now to see how they go, and uh, but because they might take two years to get to the right height. Mm -hmm. And 
so we get less money for the evergreens, but they take twice as long. <laughs> so it's a, it's a tricky thing. Um, and so we also have a web page with information about the different resources. And um, I have a, a short summary uh, video that I can show, and then um, I can expound on any aspect of this quite well if we have questions once we see the, the video. Um, we've been doing this since January 2019, and uh, just building it from nothing, from the idea. The research was there with Julie Edison and Meredith, and that's the kind of the backbone of it as we then made a plan going forward. We still continue to work together. All right, I'm gonna swap. Can I have the microphone? Thank you. I'm in the forest. Those trees out there become almost like old friends, but because of climate change, northern Minnesota. Sorry, folks, I'm going to try one more time, a different thing. I come alive when I am in the forest. Those trees out there become almost like old friends. But because of climate change, northern Minnesota is warming up quickly and the forest is dying. It's really hard to see. My name is Cree Bradley. I run Chelsea Morning Farm with my husband, Jason. We love to grow things, plain and true, and we love trees. And so when this forest assisted migration project came about, we were so compelled to get involved in it. The forest assisted migration project is where farmers grow climate smart trees that we can then plant in northern Minnesota so they'll survive as climate changes around them. The University of Minnesota Duluth distributed the seeds to us. These species, white pine and red oak, are the same species that are growing here, but these seeds have come from an area just south of this region where they're adapted to be growing in slightly warmer temperatures. Trees do an amazing job at sequestering and absorbing carbon, and so it seems very much logical that we would look to nature as part of a solution to climate change. As part of the project, the Nature Conservancy and other partners will buy 40,000 trees and use them in their restoration efforts. We are small growers and it takes a lot of capacity to take on an enterprise like this. It is a financial risk and to know we have an end outlet for the trees, that's really exciting. It's such a huge problem. We face climate change and we need big solutions. There's no question about that. I think if we can all step forward and do more, we will make a difference, but it's going to take everyone. My hope big relics someday long into the future. If you struggle to lose weight, you must send this. <laughs> you too. <laughs> so uh, I like that as kind of a summary, kind of kind of recaptures kind of all the different slides I've had previously. Uh, I bet you all have questions. Yeah, uh, I'm wondering the genetics uh, from a white super deer. They are quite a bit different. So down there can survive in cooler or warmer climate, but these structures might not. Yeah, white cedar's on the way out. Northern white cedar? Northern white cedar. Currently, in current situation, they are in decline. And the white cedar to go way south of here. That's the goal. 
We don't have the research on that, but that we have white cedar seed from central Minnesota that we are planting this year. So a lot of research has been done on some oaks and some other species, but not on every species. And so that's been the consistent trend to have Southern genetics brought up and have success, but we don't know that for sure on black cherry or other things. So, yeah, question. Um, a couple of questions. The focus is entirely on the canopy trees. The forest is more than the canopy. Sure. And so that's one question of mine about if there's any concern about the understory. Yeah. And then the second is about between tamarack and black spruce, but the veteran forest, which and I know the situation with, with ash, the yeah. black ash is completely ignored in the discussion. Yeah. And I don't know if that's because of the ash borers or correct. Or right. The things. black ash are definitely um, now they've been spotted in two harbors. Um, and one of the ideas. So different species have been thrown around, and I'm part of a, a group with the uh, Forest Service, DNR, and other experts that get to listen in on their genetics talk, and they say, well, what about this species? And they talk about it and uh, <laughs> try and figure out what the three species that are being looked at to fill in the wetlands that are being challenged right now are um, swamp white oak, uh, hackberry, and silver maple. But I would also say, at least on our farm, the Boma Gilead seems to be doing okay, but generally poplars on the decline. Um, so there might be other things, but those are the three species that talk about, but hackberry seeds are very hard to find, and very tough to get. So, so interestingly enough, in a lot of these discussions, those, discussions don't happen up front because guess what? They're not commercial. Mm -hmm. And so, but for us who are concerned about wetlands and other things, that's the conversation we need to keep bringing up into the conversation to say, how is that going to affect the one more back here? We have a couple of friends who love the boggy waters and we're good. Now in South, we brought them, they were thrilled at small uh, spruce. Yeah. So far, doing okay. Good. The reverse idea: if we were down in the south and dig up a little tree and plant in here, um, would that be a, our small scale of a helpful thing to be doing? Yes, but one of the advantages of this project is going through the seed versus bringing plants. With plants, you can bring other diseases, other things, and so we actually. Uh, been talking with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture because they certify us as a nursery type of operation. And that was one of the arguments I said to them, we're not, most nurseries, they buy stuff from all over the country with whatever, and then they bring it here. And that just adds another level of concern. So that's what's nice about this is broadening the genetics. So as a forest, you know, this is, uh, seed 401, and that's from the Aiken, Southern Aiken area. And so each, each collection will have different genetics, number of parents. So when you put them all together into our program of the you know, 20,000 Northern Red Oaks, you'll have a lot of genetic variability as broad as possible. Because as we have changing times, look, we had a drought last year and we had a lot of water this year. And so we don't know how this is going to play out. General trends are definitely proving themselves. But what's going to be drier? What's going to be wetter? What, you know, all those things, microclimates, those things. So broader genetics uh, even works, as I've encountered some people don't believe in climate change. Um, I say broader genetics still works, right? So, so that's the cool thing about it. We can stay out of that. We don't need to go there broader genetics, and as we're seeing, better research with Southern genetics. I had a couple of questions from the Zoom crowd, and one of them was, are we sure that the Southern genotypes won't migrate northward on their own, 
with natural selection taking place? Good question. Yes, forests have moved in the past. When the glaciers left, they moved in. How long did it take them? Thousands, you know, thousands of years. And so this is our situation. If because of the dramatic speed of this, trees can't walk that fast. Um, and so we are delegated to say, well, what can we do to help that? So being very careful, very strategic, very deliberate, how do we walk that to the north faster? Because we're talking about a 50 to 100 year cycle, not 10,000 years. So it's a great question and it's an important thing to lift up. So are you are you strategically trying to mimic what you anticipate the natural migration would be? Or in other words, another question was, would you be planting species that are not presently found or common or wouldn't even be projected? Right. So that's that's the big debate, right? What to plant, you know, um, the easy stuff, we call them the green go varieties. Those are the ones that are already here. And all we're doing is bringing in central and southern genetics of Minnesota within 250 kilometers. Bring it north. So the yellow ones are like, oh, there's little threads coming in. There's a little hemlock grove in Carlton. There's a little bit of river birch sliding in there. Some black cherry and Aiken. Those are the yellow crops that are begin little populations, little spurs coming in. And those are more easily and likely to be the future forests here and would we probably need to do. And we, you know, on that list before we saw some of those uh, species that are in the yellow, the, the black cherry, the river birch, uh, and those are in the yellow. Then there's the red, like shagbark hickory. Um, that's in South Bay Edge, right near Iowa. So we're holding off on the red ones, um, but 250 kilometers, anything within that range is likely to be what the forests will thrive in with current trends. I'm sorry if I missed it, but is there a forest forest part of your discussion? Because I'm just curious about you know reforestation planners if they're going to be. Forward thinking, like you're thinking, right. in terms of, you know, like right. boundary waters. Absolutely. And that's why I'm on that committee with the Forest Service geneticists. Um, so we're having these conversations. But as you can imagine, um, it's like the, with the DNR, the DNR has had you have to get your seed within a certain location history. The idea was, but so they are getting on board, but probably a little more lethargic. <laughs> um, and so I actually had an email this morning with someone on that exact subject saying, yes, we're doing similar things to the DNR, but there's different interests. And if you look at the science, if you look at the facts, and you look at the rate, of some groups and some organizations feel this has to happen quicker. Others are, are more cautious institutionally. So that's that's the dilemma. It's one back there. Are, are your small growers turning all their seed into the? Uh, into the yeah. So are they selling to small people. Um, so right now, all of our seeds going wholesale to the Nature Conservancy and then Minnesota Power because they've got the. Sorry. 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 Individuals who are 500 Northern Red Oak that didn't meet the height criteria of the niche concerns. So I'm going to bring them to the farmer's market and sell them. <laughs> Not here, but down in Finland and sell them because then homeowners can put them in. This is a perfectly good tree. It's got the soil. It's a really easy transplant type of situation. And so we're hoping that 
will then be able to sell online bunches of 20 to, uh, and because we have farms all over, maybe you'll, you'll get it from a farm from, you know, from Embarrass. Um, maybe, you know, an Aiken, they'll get it from one of the Aiken farms. So, so that's the idea is we want to meet our demand because it's part of this program. They're supporting us. They're kind of, we know we've got a sale. And when we didn't produce as many as we had hoped, it was like, okay, there's no, you know, penalties or anything. They're really supportive, really important on enabling us to grow because of that. But we really want to get these two private landowners through that network, through the North Shore uh, Forest Collaborative, through forestry organizations. And so that's where I would see, look for probably next spring, all of these that didn't make height, that made it through the winter, we'll want to get them because I don't want to carry it another year. I'm still going to get a buck for it, but it's going to be taller. <laughs> and I will have had to keep it alive all year. So that will be a great niche that private landowners would be a win-win because you're going to get a nice cheap tree that's really a good quality that has the genetics for climate forest. Um, and, and that's in a container that you can just plant, you know. So we take them out, we wrap them, and then we'll box them and send them, I guess. We, we got to figure all that out. I have two new forester vistas coming as part of climate uh, uh, core that's just formed. And so I'm hoping to get a lot of stuff. I have, this is one project of about 20 projects I have for my job. It had to take about 40% of my time. Um, but with the two full-time forestry ones, we're gonna be able to get, to get that online thing going, get some of these things going. We also have to incorporate as a group of farmers, become a cooperative. So we don't each individually have to buy a uh, nursery license because some are growing a thousand to try it out. The license costs 200 bucks. It doesn't make sense. So um, they also put me on their committee to change the rules. Um, so I'll, I'll have the farmer voice going into that rule change. That's as thing I guess. You had a question? Yeah, what does the land look like where you're planting these? So you, for instance, would you would someone plant some of the Greenwood burn, the steer burn, where it's almost completely empty. All sorts of, farm. yeah. And the Nature Conservancy is turning that now. Mm -hmm. I do know when you plant the Northern Red Oak in the shade, it takes a long time uh, to grow. Um, so I think they'll, they're planting them based on the, the slope, the angle, what they think the most force will be, and then they're planting. So each, it's as diverse as you can imagine. Uh, interplanting, there's, you know, at home, what I'm hoping to do is plant 10 to 20 of each species um, from, in each year, plant another one or two uh, so that I'm getting genetics from each year's gathering. And then I, our farm will become, our land will become a living seed uh, uh, nursery. So then, even though it's grown in Finland, the genetics will be from all of those areas so they can collect seed there and spread it there. So the idea is we'd love to do that throughout the area and create private um, living um, orchards of climate forward species, uh, genetics. And so that's our goal. So I hope we live at least 20 years so I can get genetics from the next 20 years and put it in each one GPS spot so you can press Northern Red Oak, and you'll see the, the 20 dots show up, and then they'll go to the seed. Yeah. Well, there was just someone on the Zoom who wanted you to go back to the understory plants. Oh, yeah. That was a good question on the understory plants. Uh, Mike Ruckin, Ruckenbecker, I think, uh, he's retired now, but he was really talking about the understory species. And we're playing with the idea of, plant, of doing some of those seedlings. Um, I would imagine similar, similar realities exist with them, the climate, and I think it's a really important question, uh, especially if we start seeing the jumping worms or other things coming in that's going to further compromise the organic matter in the top layer of the soil. So that's an area we've, we're trying to grow basswood with, <laughs> trying to figure out how to do what we have you know, set up 
but there is a need, there's lots of needs um, to explore what that looks like with the understory. What, what will it look like? What, what yeah. Well, southern species are growing in a lot more soil. Do they not care if they get moved up here at least less soil? Well, that's one of my concerns, right? Yeah. Uh, Northern Red Oak, where I where I um, went to school in in North Carolina, had you know 100 feet of soil under. Uh, not everything's going to grow well, and so that's which species are likely to thrive in this rocky area. Just as you're coming to town, that area is it's really tricky. Yellow birch, maybe. Um, you know that there, there's so that's. That's part of the planning is which species are going to thrive because we want more than just survive. We're, that's what things are trying to survive right now. It looks terrible. It's fire danger. There's a lot of problems with survival mode. We want to figure out how to get the right species in to thrive um, so that it's healthy and it can endure dry periods and, and the soil is building over time. Uh, I do know we're going to start seeing, you know, uh, turkeys. I don't know. You don't have turkeys up here yet, do yeah, you? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so everything's changing. Porcupines. Porcupines. Oh, well, they're, they're good for the, yeah. for the uh, fishers. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so all that's Finland, we don't have them. They come as far as two harbors. Um, so... So all of those are part of that changing environment. And as these species change, so will the disposition for different combinations of wildlife. Uh, so it's, I, I tell you, yesterday, a couple of days ago, our, our water pump stopped on our farm. And we have a, a, a hundred year old windmill that pulls the water up with a rod, pulls the rod up, and we pulled the pipe yesterday, 200 feet of two inch pipe, all that water up, pulled it up, corrosion, the pump's no longer working. You had a dickens of a time getting the boom through the, the tower to get the pipe up. And I had my son who was being more sentimental than me. We're like, we're gonna put it back. We're gonna do another 30 years convert it to an electric, we're solar powered, it'll be a solar powered electric pump. You know, there goes the windmill. In Texas, you used to have all the windmills and now they're going with a solar panel and a pump. Um, so uh, I shed a tear <laughs> on all the changes we're seeing. So that's something we've got and we gotta let it go and figure out how to make it work so we can leave something worth growing into for our next <laughs> what, what kind of trees would grow best in an area like the Greenwood uh, Forest? Well, I, I think white pine is a good one. I what, think what was the, question? Uh, uh, the, the question was about the Greenwood burn area. Um, what you still see thriving is some of the red and white pine. Uh, I think yellow birch and, and basswood would be good additions on certain slopes, certain hills, um, you know, especially in the areas that are poplar now. Um, some of those mixed uh, species might be better. Uh, birch, you know, yellow birch likes a good soil. So that's a, it's an issue. So there's a lot of different things to consider. Uh, along the rivers, river birch, is that something? Or, you know, is that, should that be up here? Those are the questions. Uh, it's coming, how far do we bring them? How fast do we bring them? Because we want, by the time the conditions are such, for them to be of seed bearing age. So you're looking at 15 to 25 years from now, just for them to seed. So, you know, the idea of them coming up naturally is not going to happen just getting it to work with this forest assisted migration project is, is, is part of it. And the, to go back to the DNR and the Forest Service, they are shifting. They are changing their zones. They are thinking differently. Um, but speed, the, the, the speed is what. Well. 
differences. Question. What are the ecological risks of assisted migration? Well, the ecological risks, uh, they're there. There's, you know, um, you hate to bring in a species that's moving into the area that becomes a weed. Like say it dries up and doesn't get wet in the future, you know, then it might lend itself more to red cedar. And maybe they don't want red cedar compared to other things. Loggers don't like it's not a very attractive tree. And, you know, and uh, so there are risks whenever you're tinkering. The great thing about this is the majority of our work is species that are already here were just brought in genetics. And the next group, which is the only ones we're dealing with right now, are all the yellow group, which are already coming, but not fast enough for what we see coming. The bigger risks I see is bringing stock from Georgia and other places in tree form, buying it from other places where you can then bring disease or worms stuck in roots. Or I think that is the bigger risk. So that's why I really want to keep our pro about seeds. To trees um, and that that alleviates a lot of that uh, the risk is you know humans have screwed this up we can screw up reclamation projects too um, and so that's what's fun about these meetings with the dnr and the forest service people who like ah, i don't want to change to people like oh you gotta do something really fast to kind of just to have those forums to chew on those well what are the potential downsides and if it's just commercial but it's integrity wise for the ecosystem, we need to lift that up. We want to plant this because it's better integrity for the diversity of our wetlands, even though you're not gonna make any money from it. Um, so that's that whole balancing act because um, they service the DNR and other service lots of different interests, you know, whether it's trails or you know, vehicles or logging. Uh, whereas the Nature Conservancy is more about the integrity of the forest. So, so different groups are in different places based on who they're serving and what their constituents are. So a couple of questions, one more back here. I was gonna say, it seems complicated because I don't know if the weather's changing fast enough at the right times of year <laughs> to accommodate the speed with which you want to do this. And you talk about basswood and silver maple, uh, green ash or things that are kind of in a micro environment yep. of river edges or places like that. Yeah, they're or inland on the north shore. Yeah, right. What are you doing? Yeah, and that's, that's again, that's really why um, I pressed with the DNR. Collectors want to sell as much seed as quick, you know, if I can get 10 bushels from these three oaks, I'm gonna get 10 bushels and sell it. And so the genetics are a little more narrow with the DNR because in order to subsidize the seed collection to make sure that those genetic interests are there, more parents, more locations, that all costs a lot of money. Scouting, the, you know, whole network of GPS points, that's not economically viable. So we also have to lean into that as institutions like the DNR. We are in the interest of also doing this because the economic model for seed collecting won't work because we want the broader genetics so that it, if it is drier, then it'll select for a collage that we put there, both in species and in genetics. And that's the idea is diversify as much as possible within the realm of reality. Yeah, we've got there first and then others. Seeds being collected here for 300 miles north of here. That is an excellent question. In fact, uh, we have been asked by groups in Canada, hey, can you start collecting seed for us? So I imagine that map where it seeds in the south, that there'll be an opportunity in the north for us to collect for Canada. Um, because like many things, things don't, you know, science doesn't change by the border. Yeah, corner. Again, with the private landowners, are we able to help private landowners sort of assess their property for what would 
Right, and I think a first good step is the four stewardship plans because they plan what you want them to plan for. So I took my four stewardship guy who I had come to and well, one, he didn't get paid as much in the end because I had him do so much work. Um, I had 25 different biomes, <laughs> systems I wanted on the 120 acres. Um, and so he then addressed, yeah, basswood and yellow birch would be good here, you know, to give that forester assessment. Um, uh, my, you know, I took dendrology. I've been learning a lot, but, you know, micro slopes and soil types relative, all that intricacy, they're the experts. Um, what I'm hoping to do too with these forestry vistas is for next spring, some private landowners that want to plant, maybe they want to plant, but they're, they can't plant them, they're getting old, they got a bad back, is to run crews and, and help people plant on their private lands. Nature Conservancy has their system, the Minnesota Power has their workers, but private property owners, that might be another way to get this climate forward uh, trees into more areas that otherwise wouldn't. But you also have to be able to tech them. Deer love red oak too. They'll pick uh, pine first, but then they'll go oak. Um, and so that's all a challenge too. And, and again, I'm all for lowering deer populations. Uh, but, but again, different groups have different interests and yeah. politics is everywhere. Yeah. yeah, one more question. My, my wife is uh, waiting on 500 white spruce from the DNR. Yeah. Uh, they should be here this week. Uh, what sort of sites would they go best? One north facing? Or? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's where they are now is uh, we have a, all our north slopes in our farm are all the spruce and fir. Um, uh, and, and that would be natural just because of that. But, I would get a forester out there and do a forest stewardship plan. The good thing about the forest stewardship plan is you get a discount from your taxes after. So it'll pay for itself. And you have these cool, beautiful pictures with all that. And the DNR does them, the Soil and Water District does them. And so if you want it done faster, the private sector does them. Uh, but you will get it paid back in uh, tax uh, credit. And, and that's fun. Or just if you make a good pie, someone mentioned pie back there, or something you could lure someone out there to walk with you. Um, I'm, I'm getting our 120 acres pretty well. We, and, you know, we're really looking at planting where the spruce and fir are all dying and, and thinning. And um, we're planting in diversity depending on depths of slope. I planted a 33 years ago, we planted 10. Uh, walnuts. Wow. And um, nine died right away. And one lived, and it's only on a foot and a half to summer. And it lived, and it grew about this tall and stayed this way. Every new shoot got frozen off, new shoot got frozen off. Then the last decade with the changes, it's up to about 30 feet. We got our furs. <laughs> we're jumping up and down all the way along, uh, and it's about you know five inch diameter it's 33 years old we planted the same group of trees in southern minnesota west of the cities and it's this big around and it's 70 feet tall so things it's a hard place we i mean even though we've gained two weeks on a whole which two weeks? <laughs> um, we just had snow. We drove. We had snow on our road till uh, till uh, May seventeenth this year. Uh, North slope. Um, I three four years ago we had a frost August twenty fourth. So, but in the cold part, in our first decade, our shortest growing season was thirty three days between frosts. July fifteenth we had a frost and August 18th, and then the 19th and 20th were freezing zone. So it is longer, but who the heck knows 
generally, I think it's more long in the fall and less certain in the in the spring. That's what I'm experiencing. Um, but is it wet? You know, uh, you know, was it wet, dry? It was dry at all get, and we got rain, rain, rain in the fall, at least where we were, filled everything back up. You know, it's all challenging. And that's uh, when I took a class 38 years ago, when they talked about theoretically this climate change, said a lot of unknowns and more extremes. 38 years ago, they're right. And it was a very good professor. So, but at the time, you know, I'm 20 years old, and I'm like, sure, whatever. <laughs> whatever. So, well, thank you very much. Thank you.